Hey everyone. You know, this, uh, this term, we're all in this together is a kind of a great rallying cry for, you know, how we're going to all deal with, uh, the pandemic COVID-19 and, and so on. And it's sort of a term to kind of say, okay, well, or a rallying cry to say like, we're all equal in, in how we're going to deal with this. Or we all have to help each other. But an unfortunate thing is that the situation that we're in, like all of us deal with it differently, right? I mean, I mean, the pressure and the weight and the burden of the pandemic affects all of us differently based on our predepositions. We like, you might have come into the pandemic dealing with some sickness in your body. You may you may have come into uh, the pandemic with with mental health issues. You may have come into the pandemic grieving a loss, or even within the pandemic, you may have lost someone close to you. And so the term we're all in this together, yeah, it, it sounds great, but quite, well, quite honestly, in, it doesn't actually speak directly to what each and every one of us are dealing with, because based on our presuppositions, we're all dealing with it differently. You know, uh, I worked at a sports store, I worked at a sports store uh, for, you know, about, you know, three years, and I was supervisor there in, in the shoe department. And I just loved it. I really enjoyed, um, I really just enjoyed, like, learning about shoes and, and seeing all kinds of different shoes and what the new shoe was. And, and, and every time a new shoe came out, it was our responsibility as shoe salesmen to learn everything about the shoe and who or what type of customer this shoe was actually made for. So there's some shoes that have a higher arch for you if you have flat feet, and there's some shoes that'll help support you if you have really wide feet, or or maybe you have a really high arch, so there's a shoe that'll help you try to keep your foot neutral. Um, but the fact is that more often than not, a lot of people came in looking for shoes that we offered, and the shoe would kind of help them with their gait. It would help them with you know, how they're carrying their body, you know, how they walk all the time. And you can see it in sometimes in somebody's body if you, or if, even in their feet, just how or, or what's wrong or, or what's out of place, you know, in their whole makeup. And some people would come in and they'd say, well, you know, I had a, you know, a car accident or I had this injury or I had this or that happened to me. And I want a shoe to kind of help me with, you know, getting back into sports or getting back into being healthy. Can you suggest a shoe for me? So, I mean, I have a list of them I could give, and I could give it to them, but the truth is, as much as they would want to encourage us to believe this, the shoe doesn't correct the, the presupposition, the predisposition of someone's body. It can't correct that. It can't fix it. It kind of, well, covers it up. But the burden of what this individual is carrying, what has been given to them or what they're dealing with, I could only do my best to suggest something that would just help them to endure that process, to endure the life that they have been given. All of us are burdened with different things, predispositions. All of us have our own different stuff, and some of them are from circumstances or from the world, right? If we think about the unholy trinity, the things that are affecting us as believers, uh, you know, the world that is, is, that is against God, and we could use, for example, our circumstances with the pandemic. You know, there's a virus out there that is that is harming people. Uh, we already have maybe have something in our body right now that is is actually making us unhealthy. Maybe there's parts of some of our organs that are not working properly. You know, these are circumstances. These are that are that are in the world that are putting pressure and that are, are a burden on us. That's like the first tier or the third tier, I might say. The second tier is is just relationships. Right under the pandemic, we have all kinds of things are happening in our family. So we have our, our kids at home who are struggling with not seeing their friends and they're struggling with online learning and they may or may not be getting ahead. Maybe this fits them, maybe it doesn't fit them. And so as parents, you're struggling with that. Then you're also struggling with making sure that they stay on top of their school and it's, and then you're getting frustrated with that. So that, that second tier of relationships, that's putting a burden on you. That's only one example. I could give multiple examples. Some marriages, even under the, under the pandemic right now, 
you take the pandemic and you put that on top of somebody who's going through a difficult marriage. Man, that's all kinds of pressure. What a burden. But then the, the last tier, I kind of like to call this tier one, is what's going on in your own head. Even, even your thoughts attack you. And the Bible calls it uh, the flesh, you know, this, the noun sin that lives inside of your body. It's in you, but it's not of you. And it desires to take advantage of you, your emotions, to bring you to death, to make you experience death in your everyday life. And so you have your circumstances, what's going on in the world is affecting you. You have things going on in your family, in relationships. And then on top of that, there's stuff going on in your brain telling you that maybe it's your fault that your kids aren't excelling. Maybe it's your fault that your marriage is not working. Maybe it's, it's your fault that your marriage failed. Maybe it's your fault that, you know, things are so bad, you know, in Canada for the church, and maybe you should do something about it. Maybe you should fight for justice. Maybe it's your fault and you should be doing something about it. You should be doing more. And when this happens, it robs us of rest. You know, it's, it's like you go to sleep with stuff in your head and you're disturbed by it and it disturbs your sleep. You, you're restless. You don't really sleep. You know what I'm talking about? You know, and then, and then you wake up in the morning and maybe you didn't sleep at all. Maybe you, or maybe you did sleep, and then you, as soon as you wake up, you're like, it's back. This gnawing voice in your head letting you know how weak, how incompetent, how much of a failure you are, how you're never going to overcome this sin that you keep habitually doing, or how you're not strong enough to endure all three tears of burdens you might be experiencing. I hope that you were hoping <laughs> that I'm going to be encouraging in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm getting there. I, I, I'm getting there. I, I want us to be encouraged because I know that all of us are dealing with this weight and this burden of our circumstances in different ways, and it's all affecting us. So we need to under think about what does the Bible say about our burdens? What does our Heavenly Father say? What does Jesus say? What does the Holy Spirit have to say about, about these things that we're struggling with? You know, one verse came to mind for me uh, right away when I was kind of processing this, this conversation about burdens. And it was Psalm 55, verse 22. Psalm 55, verse 22 goes like this. It says, Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. And there's lots of verses about burdens, but this one came up, like came right up to me right away, you know, when I was kind of going through this process. And, you know, right away you're like, okay, that sounds great. Um, how, could, how, how do I apply this? And what does it mean? that the righteous will never be moved. I mean, what kind of promise is that? I, I'm feeling moved right now. Right? Like I, I, you know, some other translations say the righteous will never be shaken. It's like, listen, my situation right now is like I'm being shaken. It doesn't seem as though this promise makes a lot of sense. And then what does this look like for me to cast my burden on the Lord? Because as good Christians, there's, there's usually two things that we do when we're under this kind of stress, we have this kind of weight on us. We, we, maybe we, we bunker down and we just kind of wait. You know, we, we're kind of hoping that time will heal all wounds. The unfortunate thing is that time heals clean wounds, as Pastor Ross had led us to understand not, not too long ago. Or maybe we're looking for ways to escape. And when I went to this psalm, and this verse in particular, I decided to look at the whole chapter. And this whole chapter relates very well to what a lot of us are experiencing. In this chapter, we see all three tiers of pressure being put on one individual. And the individual is David. It's, this is actually a psalm that David, you know, King David in the Old Testament had written. And on top of that, a lot of commentators would argue that this is very much a prophetic psalm. 
This is a psalm that was actually reflects or is by a bit of a typology of what Jesus experienced. But even on top of that, again, we can read our own stories into this psalm. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this chapter. We're going to look at Psalm 55. And what we're going to see is that main verse that I just read, Psalm 55, verse 22, that's, the, that's like the foundation of this entire chapter. Everything's building to this point of that, of that verse. And we're going to see in the whole chapter how, the how and the why to make sense of that statement. That we are to cast our burdens on the Lord and that he will sustain us and that he will never permit the righteous to be moved. We're going to see that we can cast our burdens on the Lord. And why? Because when we're burdened down, our Heavenly Father familiarizes Himself. He fortifies us. So I should say it again. Our Heavenly Father familiarizes Himself with us. He fortifies us and He fights for us. We're going to see that in this verse. And it's so important for us to understand this. You know why? Because, you know, this talk about casting your burdens is difficult. When we're having all kinds of struggles... It's hard. It, you know, we want to go to our friends. We want to go to other people. We want to find all kinds of solutions outside of, of God. And usually when we're under a lot of stress, it's hard to cross that threshold to bringing it to God and trusting him, especially when we're so, so overwhelmed. And my prayer is that this morning as we go through this, this, this chapter together, that we'll be able to take that step that some of us who haven't taken that step or hesitated to take that step to cast our burdens on him, to trust him with what we're going through, that we'll be able to do that. And if you're already in the habit of it, and that you'll be able to do it in a new way that gives you peace and rest. All right. That's a lot of talk. Um, let's jump in and pray this morning. So, Heavenly Father, you know, the other thing is true. When we don't give our burdens to you, then we're not allowing you to be the redeemer. We're not allowing you to be the provider. We're not allowing you to be the healer because that's what you are. And so if we trust that and we believe that, then we'll be willing to give over the things that we're struggling with. And so I pray for a release this morning. I pray if there's any strongholds in our thinking that prevent us from receiving your word today, that you'd remove it so we'd be able to hear it and respond to it. Um, but I pray even in my own heart that you would give me um, that same freedom to receive what I'm, what I'm speaking right now. I pray this right now in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, what we're going to learn, you know, again, what we're going to learn through this, this, this chapter is that, is that we can cast our burdens on the Lord because, because our Heavenly Father familiarizes himself with, with us. He he. He fights for us, but he also fortifies us. He strengthens us. And the first point we want to look at this morning is the whole point about familiarizing himself with us. But in order for us to do that, we do have to look at the context. We have to look at, at what kind of uh, chapter, what kind of Bible text we're looking at. And so we're actually going to be talking about a song. Right? I mean, the Psalms are, are, were generally put to music. Some of them were, some of them weren't. But this one in particular is actually called a mass kill. It's actually a song. So we're actually going to be looking at a song that David wrote. And in order to understand why he wrote the song, we're going to look at the context of where, you know, um, what a lot of commentators believe is the reasons why he wrote it. Now, one of the trends right now in, in worship music, and actually we just listened to one of the songs I'm going to mention right now, is, um, is one of the trends we see in worship music is, is that a lot of songs are building up to the vamp or the outro. So if you're involved in, in you know, in worship ministry or, or you're involved in writing music or any or anything like that, or even just a lover of music, you'll notice that that trend is happening where the verse and even the chorus, they seem kind of, kind of subdued in comparison to what you experience in the outro. So even a song like Graves versus Gardens, you know, you have your chorus, you know, it's kind of nice, but then it's all about getting to the end where you get that anthem cry of, you turn graves into gardens, right? Do, 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 right? And it's supposed to be this giant, you know, group response, this anthemic response of building up our faith. It's supposed to be an opportunity for us to respond with our whole hearts 
to the statements that are true. And we're supposed to do it corporately. And what's interesting is that it's not really a new trend. It's something that actually is represented in the Psalms. It's even especially this Psalm right here, Psalm 55. Because the, the, the last two, the last two verses are the main focus. They're the foundation of this entire chapter. And, and that's, it's, it's very important to understand that when we're reading the Psalms, and why I say that is, is because if you read this chapter, what you see is David journaling with God. He's expressing his emotions recklessly. He's saying, God, I'm complaining to you. I am moaning with despair. My heart is in anguish. He says, some, some, some verses say, um, some translations say he's distracted with the, all the things that he's dealing with. He's so overwhelmed and he's having this conversation with God back and forth, telling God how he feels and kind of writing down what he, you know, he feels like God is saying back or what he believes about God. And all of a sudden he gets to the end of this chapter and that's where we hit, um, you know, Castor burns on the Lord. And it's almost as if, you know, he's writing this and then he just kind of gets an epiphany, you know, a revelation. And he kind of looks up from his, his writing and just says, cast your burdens on the Lord. He makes a declaration that goes across all the generations of people who will know God, who will become children of God. And he speaks to them and his tone changes the, the, it's the only part of the chapter that becomes an imperative. Everything else is him talking to God. You know, first person, third person, first person, third person. And all of a sudden he makes an imperative. And so here we understand because of that, that this is a very important part of this chapter. So we're going to dive into it. We want to look at it. But first, before we do that, we have to understand the context. What's going on here in this chapter? Or, or, what, or what's the context for why David wrote it? Well, it's, it's definitely debated, but I would argue that it's very much true that this was written at towards the end of David's career as king, and it's happening at a time when his son Absalom has rebelled against him. So his son is rebelling against him as king, and what his son has done is that he's gone and gotten some of the army, and, and the Bible says all of the elders of Israel. So David's supporting cast, a good majority of them, are now behind David's son against him. And so David realizes that he is in trouble. So he gets whoever's faithful to him and his family, and he gets up and he leaves. He leaves his post as king. He leaves Jerusalem, and he's going up the Mount of Olives, and he's running away from his son who's attacking him. The worst part about this is that we understand from 2 Samuel kind of 15 through 17 that David's counselor, his close friend, uh, has been persuaded by Absalom, his son, to now become Absalom's counselor. And so this guy, and the Bible says this, this guy who David and Absalom both regarded as somebody who hears from God, who consults with God, and speaks speaks on behalf of God to them. This person has now turned their back on David. And so he's leaving the situation. He's lost a friend, but more than so, he's, he's, he's losing his family. He's losing his home. And even on the way out, there are people who are slurring insults at him. Even as he's leaving the city, there's people who are slurring. They're, they're, they're trash talking him as he's leaving. And he makes a comment, you know, he makes a prayer that, you know, I pray that, you know, this guy's name, this counselor, uh, Ahitho, I'm going to say it wrong, Ahithophel, you know, I pray that his counsel will become the foolishness and that nobody would listen to him. And so he goes, he leaves, and he prays this. And now the thing that's so sad about this is that a lot of us can consider maybe somebody in your life who you would consult as being somebody who, you know, hears from God, somebody who spends time with God, who can even speak on behalf of God and, and speak into your life. Some of us can consider people like that who have betrayed them. I mean, I dare I say I would hope that I would never be myself in a pastoral position, 
Um, say it would never happen to any of us as elders, but some of us have been betrayed by people who call themselves or their support, our supporting cast, who spoke with God's authority into our lives, and they betrayed us and hurt us. A lot of us have experienced that. And so we can understand a little bit of what David is, is dealing with, what he's experiencing. So here we go. He's leaving, and this guy, this counselor, this trusted friend, is now encouraging Absalom, his son, to go and do a very despicable act, a very public, humiliating act against his father in Jerusalem. It's so despicable that I don't even want to share it. I mean, you can just read it for yourself. But it's just terrible what happens to him. Uh, and so David is facing all kinds of humiliation. And what happens actually in the end is that his prayer comes true. You know, um, Ahithophel makes this comment. He says, this is what you're going to do to, to, to get rid of David, Absalom. And, and somebody else from David's camp goes and tells Absalom, no, don't listen to him. You should do this instead. Well, the truth is, is that if Absalom had actually listened to Ahithophel, he would have definitely taken over David. But because, for whatever reason, the counsel of Ahithophel was foolish to Absalom, he decided to go with the other guy, and then David got, got ground and came back. And he's a very, very strategic warrior and was able to go back and take the um, Jerusalem from his son. And if some of you know the rest of the story, it doesn't end up well for the counselor and doesn't end up well for Absalom. And so I paint all this picture because it sounds like this is exactly where David's at. And so some commentators would say, okay, this happened before, maybe it happened during, maybe it happened after. We're not sure exactly when you wrote it, but let's jump in together. Let's look at this. Let's look at this chapter together. All right. Psalm chapter 55, verse 1 says, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. He's saying, stop the bombardment of burdens. Look at my circumstances. I'm kicked out of my home. The people are rebelling against me. Even my son and my family, my relationship, right? I mean, my close relationships, tier two, right? Now he's against me. And even my close friend is against me. Then he goes on to uh, verse two. He says, attend to me, O God, and answer me. I am restless in my complaint, and I moan because of the noise of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they drop trouble on me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. This term, drop trouble on me, uh, it's actually the exact same word in Hebrew as the word shaken or moved in verse 22. So we're going to come back to that, okay? But you can see we're dealing with tier two of burdens, right? Relationships, family stuff is going wrong. It's close relationships that are all messed up. Next, he says, my heart is in anguish within me. Terrors of death have fallen upon me. My heart, this is his emotions he's saying. I'm filled with anguish. Next, he says, fear and trembling come upon me and horrors overwhelm me. He's experiencing deep, deep anxiety. And now this is tier one, right? This is what's going on in his head. He's got all these other things going on, but now even in his head, he's overwhelmed with his emotions and his thoughts. He has deep anxiety where, the, where he's afraid of dying. You know, that dark in-between place where you're afraid of dying. But you know that dying would be a relief from what you're experiencing. This dark, terrible in-between place. I have no idea what that's like, but this is what he's describing here. Verse 6 says this, And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and I would be at rest. Yes, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. In the middle of that, there's a word called a salah, which means basically it's an instrumental break in the song. You know, we have this really dark song, basically. Um, and we're coming to a crescendo of a little bit of hope at the end. But all of a sudden, there's this, this kind of break. And there's a break where he's describing how he would want to escape. And isn't that so many of us, right? Want a way out. 
Maybe you found ways to take a way out. Maybe even right now you're being counseled by the Holy Spirit of ways that you have tried to escape the burdens of the things you're facing. You know, I have an example of it. You know, it was just over the Christmas break. You know, I finished um, finished up school, kind of took a week off, you know, work and and uh, watched The Mandalorian. And it was great. And um, and I was looking at my semester upcoming. There's a lot of changes for us as a family. There's a lot of things, you know, a lot of predispositions. Uh, that were already challenging, but when you put COVID on top of it, it makes it all that much harder. And I was looking at the future, and I wasn't saying it out loud, and I wasn't even thinking it, but I was behaving. Do you know what I mean? Like you're behaving, like you're you're just. I was I was just grumpy. I was angry. I was I wasn't excited. Uh, I was restless. I wasn't sleeping very well. And and you know, I even spoke to Pastor Ross about it. I'm like, man, I. I just, sometimes I just feel like I just want to sit alone, you know, in the basement and just watch The Mandalorian again, all eight episodes, because it was fantastic. But I just want to escape. And and I'm like, well, I, I think it's just because I haven't really been talking to, to Jesus about what I've been feeling. And Ross is like, yeah, it's probably what it is. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll do that. <laughs> so, you know, so I took some time to, you know, to pray. And for me, usually what I do is I just kind of like, put on some music, put on a song that, you know, it's very emotive for me. And I just put on the song on my phone. I was kind of sitting alone in the dark one morning and the song came on and all I could do was, this is not, it's not even spiritual. This was just like a bodily effect. Like I just hit my knees. I just went down on my knees and I put my head between my knees and I said, Oh, it's only you. It, it has to be you. I, I cannot do this on my own ability. I cannot face this on my own. I just wept. Matter of fact, I don't even think there was words. I just kind of thought that. Like, I just I just realized that I've been caring so much and I just needed to give it to him. And for whatever reason, the music just allowed me to do it. Because here's the truth, right? I mean, if if I don't allow Jesus to be the Redeemer, because I have to allow him, because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. God's not going to push himself on me. If I don't allow him to be the healer, if I don't allow him to be the redeemer, if I don't allow him to be the provider that I believe and I say he is, then what advantage is me believing and saying that? I have to allow him to do it. And now that's the difference between casting your burdens on the Lord and then living with the despair of something that I already know is true, that I am not my own healer. I am not my own provider. I'm not my own rescuer. I'm not my own savior of my soul. There's only one person who can do that, and he already defined that he was the one who can do it. He already proved it to me, so I just need to go back to him and cast my burden on him. No more escaping. Let me tell you something. I was able to get up from that moment not with supernatural strength where I was like, all right, I've got it under control. No, everything's going to go fine now. No, that was that's not what happened. I got up from that moment knowing that things were going to be tough, but I was able to step forward into the day from a place of rest. I was able to step forward into the day from a place of rest, which is a lot different than the tense anxiety and stress that a lot of us carry. I was able to put one pant leg on in, from a place of rest and another pant leg on in a pa- from a place of rest and just get up and go and, and enjoy my day and, and make the most of that day. Now, since it was a lockdown, it was sweatpants, you know, so so I kind of got up, you know, kind of half woke up. Anyway, so let's keep reading because we still got lots to read, right? Let's keep reading. I love what David says here. He says, destroy, O Lord, divide their tongues. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around it on its walls, and iniquity and trouble are within it. Ruin is in its midst. Oppression and fraud do not depart from its marketplace. Listen, this is, this is very possibly David talking about 
the despicable things that are happening to publicly humiliate him in Jerusalem. It's very evident that David, David is looking at Jerusalem and seeing from a distance the rebellion that is happening there. Just like us, we're looking at our circumstances. We're looking at you know, how challenging it is for parents at this moment. We're looking at how challenging it is uh, for those who are caring for vulnerable people during the, the pandemic. We know how challenging it is for those who are in the healthcare system and those who are teaching kids. And we're looking at this and we're like, someone's got to fight for justice. We got to fix this. We got to do something. And it's a burden on us. Right? Tier number three, the circumstances of the world is wearing down on so many of us. But then David says this next. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But as you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, we used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. This is, now this is where a lot of commentators, and I would agree that David is talking about this man Athithophel, who from, was a religious man who David trusted as a religious man who spoke from, who heard from God. Um, and they shared a communion together about the things of God. And now this individual has betrayed him and publicly humiliated him. Incredible pressure. So, so he says this, I, I like this part. Let death steal over them and let them go down to Sheol alive. For evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. Um, he's basically saying, let death steal over them, let them die. But then he kind of changes his mind and says, wait, 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 no, no, no. Let them go down to hell alive. Don't even, not even die. Just skip that part. Let them go to hell alive. Why? Because it doesn't change anything. Evil is in their dwelling place where they are, and evil is in their hearts. And that's where they deserve to be. He's really angry. He's being very plain with God being super transparent with God. But here we, we hear God's response. Verse 16 says, But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint. Raise your hand if that's you. I, can see, I can't see you through the screen, but go ahead. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and I moan but he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. Again, tier two, relationships, people, dealing with people. Many people are arrayed against me. And I love what verse 19 says, but God will give ear God will lean in. I think this is a very intentional translation. God will lean in and hear my complaint, my moan, my despair, my the blues song that I'm writing right now. God, God is going to listen to me. And he is going to humble those who try to harm me. He who is enthroned from of old. Because these individuals do not change and they do not fear God. So you might be asking yourself, well, how do I cast things on the Lord? You know, how do I cast my burdens on the Lord? It's very simple. It's part of that process is just being honest with him. It's not looking for opportunities to run away. It's taking an opportunity when you can to be very plain with God. And God is not afraid of your strong emotions. The Bible, <laughs> even this Psalm written so many years ago, thousands and thousands of years ago, is a very plain example of how God responds to our strong emotions. He's not embarrassed. He's not angry. He's not in despair over your strong emotions, the things that you are dealing with and you're upset about. He wants us to open up. And his response is that he will listen. He will lean his ear. He will familiarize himself with you. Yes, you can cast your burdens on the Lord. And why? Because Father, our Heavenly Father, familiarizes himself with you. He is not afraid of your strong emotions and he listens. He listens to you. So when you want to escape, we don't. We complain. <laughs> we moan. We cry. We weep. We scream. We, you know, you know, even if you're screaming into your pillow, 
Well, I mean, just at least direct it at Jesus. <laughs> you know, like get it out. Like don't don't be afraid to express your strong emotions to him. Some people are van screamers, you know, like you go in the van and scream. I, I don't know. Some people are, I'm not a van screamer. Um, I, I might complain though. I might complain and weep. And I might even beg. But you know what the truth is, is that even Jesus begged. Even Jesus was tempted to escape in the Garden of Gethsemane. Even Jesus. Hebrews talks about that. Our great high priest who's acquainted with our weakness, he knows what it's like to be human. And even he was tempted to escape. And he said, Lord, take this cup from me. But we knew, we know that instead, he said, whatever you will, will that be done. But I hear you saying, Robin, I've already tried this. I've already been very plain with God. I've already been very angry with him. Um, I don't see the results. Give me something more. Okay, let's keep going then. Okay, so second point we want to talk about this morning um, is this, is that when we're burdened down, when you're burdened down, Father fortifies you. He strengthens you. Um, Psalm uh, chapter 55, verse 20 says this, My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. And then here we go. We're getting to the crescendo, right? We're getting to that part in the song where everyone's spirits are raised and we're going to make a bold faith rising, you know, trust engaging <clears throat> statement. And it's this, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. You know, obviously when we're hearing all these things about, you know, speech being softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. We can, we can see how, Jesus, how, how David, you know, is talking about this counselor of his. And he gets down in the dumps a little bit. He starts to, to think about that and dwell on that. But all of a sudden he just has this epiphany and he says, cast your burden. So there's a few words here that I really want to open up quickly for us to understand um, before we get to our last point. And it's the, and and I want to talk about that word cast. Now, cast in Hebrew is the word shellac. Now, shellac means to throw or fling, right? And to cast. And so you'll see the different translations kind of you know talk about it differently, but most of them say cast. You know, so whatever your burden is, you are supposed to throw it. <laughs> You're supposed to throw it on the Lord. And, and you know, right away, I got an illustration of, of this. And I, I want to describe it. To, I want to describe it to you, but um, not at the sake of, of hurting anyone um, uh, who might be impressionable. Because I used to be a youth pastor. And when you're a youth pastor, and some of us groups of youth pastors, uh, we're always doing games. We're always thinking about games that we can do. And so you're researching games and you're studying what games you can do because there's always going to be a time where you need to do a game with the teams that you have. Um, you can't just do dodgeball every, every week, though sometimes we did. So a group of friends of mine who were in Bible college together, we're all youth pastors, and we, a majority of us were youth pastors and were aspiring to be youth pastors. And so sometimes when you're thinking about games, you get ideas and you're like, well, I can't do this one, but that would probably be fun. Because if, but if I did do that one, that I just made up in my head, uh, I probably would get in trouble with a lot of people. Well, one of my friends came up with a game, a version of Hot Potato, that you could never, ever do with kids because you'd get in a lot of trouble with, with parents and probably the church. And this was the game. Basically, what he did is he took toilet paper and then he took gasoline. And then, okay, Disclaimer, okay, kids never do this, okay? Don't practice at home. Took this toilet paper, put it in gasoline, and then with a blowtorch, lit the toilet paper on fire. And this is a version of hot potato that we were going to play together. Now, there was a group of us who were together. We were all hanging out, and we were outside. It was kind of a rural area, so don't worry about it. It's not, not in city limits. You can do anything, out, I guess, outside the city limits. And so we're... 
we're there and it's winter time. Like it's really cold. So it's only, we're only kind of happy that there's fire <laughs> and we're all standing around in a circle. And my friend's like, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to light it. I'm going to pass it to you. I'm going to do hot potato. You got to get it away from you as fast as you can. Now here it comes. Toilet paper is going around. We're trying to do it in a circle. And this is just like a fantastic way of like learning how to do volleyball really well. You know, if you can dodge a, a wrench, you can dodge a dodgeball. Well, if you could volley a piece of toilet paper that's on fire, you're really good at volleying. So here we are, we're passing it around. And this thing is coming to me and I'm just like, oh, I'm freaking out. And I'm like, like put it away. And some of us who are like really brave, like they've taken off their gloves and they're like, okay, I'm going to try to do it with my hand. And so I tried that a few times and yeah, I think I'm just going to leave it at that. But here's just how I want to illustrate this. Because that next verb, that next word in the verse is burden. And that word burden can also be translated, what is given. It also could be translated, your lot. So cast your lot. Cast your, what you've been given, cast your burden on the Lord. And then we look at the context of this chapter. This is David talking about all the things that he's been given. He's describing all these terrible things that have happened to him. And he's just saying, these are the things that I have been given. And I'm releasing them. I'm giving them back to God. And so right away, it reminded me of this game. Here comes this toilet paper. It's on fire. And I'm just like, ah, I can't hold on to it. I got to send it, but then I got to position myself in a place where I can do that properly so I don't actually hit it back into my face or something. I know, I know, terrible stuff. But the truth is, if somebody reached out their hands to try and cradle it, hold it in a way that they could send it properly, they'd probably get burned. And sometimes, a lot of us, we've been given something from the Lord. We've been given a lot. Maybe it's sickness in your body. Maybe it's mental health issues. Maybe it's family situations. Maybe it's a series of things that happened to you when you were younger that have affected the way that you see yourself and think about yourself. So now it's made it difficult for you to move forward in life because those things are holding you down. So the world's coming at you. Other people are coming at you. And even the flesh rattling your brain about things about who you are. These are all things that are being given. And you're saying, well, how could God give that to me? Well, let me just be very honest and say, we have a really hard time trying to find ways to discredit the fact that sometimes God purposes things in our lives, purposes things that we're uncomfortable with. You know, even if you look at Genesis chapter, you know, chapter 50, verse 20, you know, Joseph, and talking about his brothers, you know about Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers so that he could become second in command in Egypt. Joseph says, listen, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. Even the chapters before that, Joseph says over and over again, God sent me, God sent me here, God sent me here so I could preserve life. And you're like, well, no, God didn't send you, your brothers did. No, no, Joseph's saying, no, God did this. For a particular purpose. And obviously when we're on this subject, we want to talk about Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you know, and God works out all things for good. Everything that we face, every series of burdens that we, we, we face, every, every tier of burdens that we struggle with, God designed it for good. <clears throat> God will take it and he'll make good out of it. But what's the rest of that verse? What's the rest of that, what comes after that? Well, it's, it's verse 29 that says, the reason that God works out things for good, the reason of the good, even describing what that good is, is the fact that we'll be transformed, we'll be made into the image of Christ. The highest value is not always our peace and comfort. The highest value isn't always things going well for us. The highest value, God working out things for good, is us being transformed and conformed into the image of his son. And so some things that we have been given, spouses, children, obviously the circumstance right now, so many of us are dealing with it at once. Sickness in our bodies, you know, um, 
and even even things that we're struggling with in our own thinking about ourselves or things that the flesh uses against us. We could say, well, it came from these other circumstances, but God says, I understand the how and the where and the why, but now I want to address the what. I want to address how I am going to work through what you've been given. I am going to work through what you've been given. And why? Because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says this, that God has planned things in advance for us to do. Good works for us to do. He's planned some things in advance. So what? So that whatever we're facing, whatever we've been given, we can cast it on him. We could give it back to him. We can allow him to work through us to face and to deal with that situation. And what happens? We become more conformed into the image of Christ. What was a great characteristic or attribute of Jesus during his time on earth? He always depended on God. He always depended on Father. We are being conformed into the image of Christ. And he wants to work through us and work through the situation that we may be given, that he might prove himself to be good, to be holy, to be strong, that he might prove himself not only to you and to others, that he is the redeemer, he is the savior of your soul, he's a lover of your soul, he's your provider. The rest of that verse, you know, we have the word sustain, um, sustain. Sustain says, uh, is the word um, yahako, which actually just, means obviously sustain, but also means to provide. You know, when we cast our burdens on the Lord, when we send back, we give back to him, we fling, we get it away, we release whatever we're dealing with to him. When we do that, he promises to sustain us. It's a very quick motion. It's not a, okay, this this burden's come to me. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to identify myself with it. You know, you grab onto that toilet paper that's on fire and you're holding onto it. Like, okay, I'm going to deal with this myself. Well, you're burning yourself. Give it back to the Lord. Let him do what he purposed to do with that. Give it back to him. And what's he going to do when we do that? He's going to sustain us. He's going to provide for us. He's going to maintain us so that we can stand firm in whatever we're facing. And, and you know, that, that word righteous you know, we're looking at that word righteous here say, okay, well, this is an identity statement, but it's not necessarily the way that David is using in the psalm. He's actually using it as a descriptor to say that those who cast their burdens on the Lord, those who trust him in that way and the Lord sustains them, those are those who are doing the righteous thing. Like, this is what the righteous do. They trust God. It's a description of who you are, of some things that, that Christian people, that people who, are, who, who understand and trust who Jesus is, this is a description of what they do. They cast their burdens on the Lord. They don't hold on and identify with the pain. Now, this sounds strong, but they don't form their identity based on the struggles that they're facing. They instead form their identity on who their Redeemer is, who their Rescuer is, who their Healer is. And when they're able to do that, God sustains them. And then it says that they will not be moved. And this word moved goes back to verse three. We're talking about it um, is, is to say basically is not to be made insecure. It's not to be made um, uh, in a place where, where what is most valuable is removed and taken from you. I think that I think the description for this word mot or shaken or moved is actually a tent pole which a lot of people back in this time would have used. They would put tent poles in the ground to put up tabernacles or or homes and so on. And so shaken describes that like a tent pole has been put in the ground. That's now shaken. It's, it's been, it's not strong enough to stand on its own and, and your home and your place of safety and your place of refuge is now insecure. This is what it's describing. Yes. There's a lot of things coming at you. Yes. There's a lot of burns that you're facing. You're facing three tiers of burdens at this point, but you are in the hand and the care of the one who is security himself. 
your most heavenly father, he will, he will never be moved. He will never be shaken. And he holds on to you. Even when the world comes against you and people come against you and even your own thoughts come against you, he will not be moved. And you are planted in him. And we can receive that. We can receive what he wants to give to us. We can be sustained when we cast those burdens. We don't try to hold on to that flaming piece of toilet paper roll, um, trying to hold on and solve it ourselves. We're not going to get burned. We're not going to get singed. We can release it and give it back to him. Let's move on to our next and our last point. Because this is what we're understanding now. Like when, when we're burdened down, you know, Father fortifies us. He sustains us. He strengthens us. He allows us to, to be able to stand in the midst of attack, in the midst of the things we're struggling with. And the last thing is that when we're burdened down, Father fights for us. You know, uh, the last verse says this, and verse 23 says, But you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days. And he ends the song with this. But I will trust in you. It's interesting, though, because there's a, there's a little bit of song craft there. So he says, I cast my burdens on the Lord, but God will cast my enemies down. God will have the final say. Doctors say this about my body. Doctors say this about the diagnosis that I have. They say, I will lose this organ. I will lose that organ. I will die in this amount of days. They all say they, they have the final word. But God says, I have the final word. When we're able to cast our burdens, the lot of what we have been given, we're able to give it to God. God says, I have the final word on what happens to you. You can trust me to care for you. Even if we talk about people and, and, and vengeance, right? You know, it's, it's kind of a tough, kind of a tough topic. We like to stay away from. It. We like to say, like, well, we, we like to paint God a little be a little more, you know, loving and you know, soft and caring, and He is all those things. But He's also a God of justice. And sometimes we need to allow God to do the repaying. You know, Deuteronomy chapter thirty-two, you know, says that God says, "Vengeance is mine. I'm the one who doles out justice." Matter of fact, when it comes to sin, all sin is actually an offense to me. And so I'm the one who's going to take responsibility for that. You don't have to take it. It's mine. And then we have in the New Testament of all places, you know, Romans 12 talks, says the exact kind of repay, kind of repaints that. It says, um, God will repay. God says, vengeance is mine. Hebrews 10 says the exact same thing. God will repay. He's the one who's going to take responsibility to pay back what has, what has been taken. Or to dole out vengeance. And it's not just a, it's not just a static event. You know, I was reminded of this, you know, recently too. Pastor Ross gave an awesome sermon, you know, recently about how we need to go to Jesus to be the one to repay us for the things that have been taken from us from other people. It really resonates with me personally. Because I just recently came into contact with, you know, you've probably been here, but something that brought up to mind to me um, a, a past event where I was deeply offended, deeply humiliated. And it was just this passing event and it happened and it just felt so much grief. It was like I was right back in that place where I was offended and humiliated to start with. And I became overwhelmed with anger. And I said, okay, well, Jesus, I have forgiven. I, I have released this, but I'm so angry right now. I need you to help me navigate this. And one thing that Jesus really spoke to me that I thought was so impactful was that the things that were taken, yeah, they were like your dignity, your self-worth. Yeah, those things were taken. That, that, was, that was an event that happened. And, but I repaid that on the cross. That was also an event that happened. And so, of course, I could just say, okay, well, what's been taken isn't really taken. I already have it and it's fine and I'll, I'll, I'll make do on my own strength. But I, I really felt Jesus say, no, but every time these memories come up, every time you revisit the hurt or the enemy revisits the hurt or, or the flesh tries to revisit the hurt, 
or situations and circumstances revisit the hurt that you experience. Every time it happens, I am right there with you. Hoping and willing to repay. To re-give to you what was taken. To give to you dignity and self-worth. To bless you again from that period of lack. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's an event that happened that you know, like the cross, that, that event that happened, it has an eternal consequence and it keeps paying back. And God is, and Jesus was saying, like, every time you remember that, turn to me because I want to give back to you what was taken. It's an ongoing repayment. Such a beautiful picture for us, I really believe. And hopefully that's an encouragement to you. So when we're burdened down, you know, we can trust that our Father is going to fight for us. So we learned a lot of things this morning. We looked at the whole chapter, we looked at the whole verse. You know, why can we cast our burdens on the Lord? We can do that because when we're burdened down, our Heavenly Father familiarizes Himself with us, He fortifies us, and He fights for us. These are things that are all true. And then when we give our burdens to God, this is also true. We're allowing Him to be who He is and what we say we believe He is. That He is the Redeemer, that He is the lover of our soul, that He's the, he's the Rescuer. We're agreeing with that statement. And, and we'll, but, we'll, but when we hold on to those things, we're just hurting ourselves. And, and, and we, we can identify with our pain. Other people can identify with their pain. But, but if our pain and our suffering becomes our identity, then we're robbing ourselves of the freedom of what Jesus purchased for us. And we're only affirming what we already know is true, is that we are not competent enough in our own ability to be a redeemer or a rescuer or helper of our own souls. And that only gives us more despair than what we started with. But if we can cross the threshold in this one way, there's other ways that we can find help, obviously. But when it comes to dealing personally with your Heavenly Father, we can cross the threshold this way and say, Lord, I complain to you bitterly about what I am facing. I'm open and honest with you. I'm taking this opportunity to share all of my dark feelings, everything I feel, every strong feeling. I pass it on to you. I give it to you in this moment. I cast my burden onto you. And I'm asking you to now empower me to walk through what you have given me. So I know that it's for my good. but I also believe that you are good and I want you to be glorified in this. I said a lot of stuff that sounds easy to do, but it's not easy. And maybe just starting today in some small way, all you can really do. Maybe even just listening to this, this has made you more upset than you started. And maybe you need to take some time to really process some things that have been said. Maybe you want to read this verse, this chapter through and, and really analyze it. But I would highly encourage all of us today to acknowledge that a lot of us are struggling with the circumstances in different ways. What I love about this verse, cast your burdens on the Lord, it's not cast your burdens, like your big burdens, right? It's like, if you're not going through a lot, you're not facing a lot, like the pandemic hasn't really bothered you. It's like, it doesn't disqualify you from casting those burdens on the Lord. And if you're going through a lot, it also doesn't disqualify you from not casting your burdens on the Lord because you're going through too much. No, everyone is equal. We're all in this together when it comes to this verse. Cast your burdens on the Lord. And also at the same time, we can acknowledge that all of us are dealing with it differently. And maybe there are some ways that we can be aware of and be conscious of how other people are dealing with it so that we can come alongside and support them and strengthen them in this most difficult effort of casting the burdens of what we're facing onto the Lord. Um, thank you so much for this time. Let me just pray for us to close. We've got a last song for you. This song is really going to bless you. Stick around. Um, fits in well with what we've been talking about today. And uh, yeah, let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, uh, I just love that the word is Lord, you know. Cast your burdens on the Lord, because that, that word in Hebrew, it, it's not just Lord as in like some separate ruler who's not present. No, no, no. It, it means covenant God. You've made a covenant with us to care for us, to be near to 
us. And because of Jesus, you are so, so, so close. You're so near to each and every one of us. So close that we can fling, we can throw, we can cast whatever we're struggling onto you. And you're more than capable of helping us carry the burden. So uh, let that be true for each and every one of us today. That's us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again, guys. Have a great morning.